Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, we're going to talk about the effects of preload and afterload on the velocity of shortening of cardiac muscles. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to start off with a few introductory concepts. So the first thing is preload versus afterload. So preload is going to be the measure of sarcomere length or end diastolic volume. So remember that when the ventricles fill with blood, the ventricles are filled up with blood, which causes the myocytes to stretch. And as the myocytes stretch, the sarcomere length is going to be stretched as well. So therefore, the amount of stretch that these sarcomeres experience is going to be the preload. Now, the afterload is going to be the force that the ventricular myocytes must work against in order to push blood into the aorta. So therefore, the afterload is going to be equivalent to the arterial pressure that the ventricles must overcome. So another thing that we have to talk about is something called isotonic contractions. So what is an isotonic contraction? So imagine you have a muscle fiber that is attached to an immovable object on this end and to a weight on the other end. Now when you stimulate the muscle, both ends of the muscle are pulled towards the center. But since the top end of the muscle is attached to an immovable object, only the one attached to the weight moves towards the center. So when the muscle stimulates, it contracts, moving the weight up. So an isotonic contraction is a contraction that occurs when a muscle has a constant load attached to it. So let's take a look at the amount of force produced during this isotonic contraction. So in order to understand that, we first have to show how much the weight actually weighed. And the weight weighed around this much. So now what we're going to do is we're going to match the tension generated by the muscle during this contraction. And when we do that, we see something like this. So what we see here is that as the contraction starts, the tension starts to build up at the muscle until we get to a peak tension. And this peak tension is maintained until as the muscle contracts and then when it relaxes, it falls back down. So what we see here is that the tension increased in the muscle until the tension generated by the muscle equaled the weight of the load. And after that, no extra force was added. So during an isotonic contraction, if the muscle is able to lift the load, the tension produced by the muscle is going to be equal to the weight of the load. So another thing that we have to talk about is the relationship between length and the amount of active tension that a muscle can produce. And how we're going to do that is we're going to look at different isometric contractions. So remember that an isometric contraction is a contraction in which the length of the muscle remains constant over the course of the contraction. And what we're going to do is we're going to stretch these muscle fibers into different lengths and measure the amount of tension produced by the muscle during the contraction. And when we do that, we see something like this. So from this graph, we see a few things. So the first thing is that there is an optimal length at which a muscle can be stretched in order to produce the greatest amount of tension possible. So it's at this optimal length where you can produce the greatest amount of tension. Now, as you start to shorten the muscle fiber beyond that optimal length, what you see is that the amount of tension that the muscle can produce decreases. And this has to do with the fact that the muscle fiber starts to collapse in on itself. And as it does, the steric hindrance builds up between the myofilaments, which therefore decreases the amount of cross bridge formation. And as we go beyond the optimal length, we see the same thing. And the amount of tension that can be produced by these muscles at these lengths will also decrease. And this is because the myofilaments start to be pulled away from each other. And therefore, there's less overlap occurring, which means that there is a less amount of uh, cross bridge formation in these muscles. So therefore, there is an optimum length where the maximum overlap between filaments occurs, producing the greatest amount of cross bridges and the greatest amount of force. So now that we have an understanding of these introductory concepts, let's talk about the effects of afterload on velocity of shortening. So let's just say we have a heart, and this heart, the ventricles, are going to be stretched to a certain length, and we'll just call this length one unit. And remember that length is going to correspond to the preload. And let's just say that the muscles, in this case, of the, mu of the heart, are experience a certain afterload or weight of one unit. What would the extent of shortening look like over the course of the contraction, and what would the tension produced look like? So this is what they would look like. So the first thing that you should notice here is that 
During the contraction, what we see here is that you have this phase in which the there is no shortening occurring. So this phase right here, where there's no shortening occurring, is going to be called the isometric phase. So this is basically equivalent to the isovolumic contraction that we see inside the cardiac cycle. So remember, in the cardiac cycle, the ventricles undergo an isovolumic contraction, where the ventricles contract, but the volume remains the same. And it does this in order to build up pressure in order to force the blood into the aorta. Now, after the ventricle really gets to a certain pressure, the ventricles start to shorten, as we see right here. So the fibers inside the muscles start to shorten. And the difference between the peak of this graph and the bottom is going to be the change in length or the extent of shortening that occurred during the contraction. And if we take the slope of this graph right here, this slope is going to be equal to the change in length over the change in time. And this is equal to the velocity of shortening. So now let's take a look at the tension produced. So remember that the tension produced by the muscle is going to be equal to the weight that the muscle has experienced or the afterload that the muscle has experienced. So in this case, the difference between this peak and the bottom is the afterload, and this whole region is the afterload shortening. So these are the main concepts that I wanted to show you from this graph. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how changing the weight or the afterload is going to affect the velocity of shortening and the tension produced by the muscle. So now let's decrease the afterload or the weight to 0.25 units. So what would be the results? So what we see here is that first of all, the extent of shortening has changed. So first of all, by the, it takes a shorter amount of time in order to, for the muscle to shorten. So in other words, the amount of time that it requires for the ventricle to build up enough pressure is shortened because the afterload is decreased. And what we also see here is that the slope or the velocity of shortening is greater than it was in the red curve. In other words, it's easier for a muscle to move a light weight than it is for a muscle to move a heavier weight. So in other words, what we see here is as we decrease the afterload, the velocity of shortening increased. And what we see here for the tension curve is that the tension produced by the heart is going to be decreased as well because it's encountering a lower or decreased load. And we see the opposite when we increase the weight or the afterload. So in this case, it takes a longer amount of time for the heart to reach its uh, a certain amount of pressure. And what we see here is the slope is also decreased. In other words, as we increase the afterload, the velocity of shortening decreased. And as a result of the increased afterload, the heart also produced a greater amount of tension. So the general rule of thumb is, is that as the afterload increases, the velocity of shortening decreases. So now let's take a look at how the preload is going to affect the velocity of shortening. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the velocity of shortening to the preload or length of the ventricular myocytes. And when we do that, we're going to look at a few different lengths. We're going to look at one, three, six, and eight units. And what else we're going to do is we're going to see the peak velocity at each of these lengths. So when we look at a length of one unit, what we see here is that the peak velocity is going to be right here. And when we increase the length of the myofilaments, what we see is that the peak velocity has actually increased. And as we continue to increase the length, what we see is that the peak velocity continues to increase. So the general rule of thumb here is that as we increase the length of the myofilaments and the stretch of the ventricles, the velocity of shortening is also going to increase as well. So now let's combine these two aspects of preload and afterload into one graph and see how they affect the velocity of shortening. So let's take a look when the length is one unit. So what we see here is that when the length is one unit, first of all, there is a maximum velocity of shortening, which is right here. And what we see here is that as the load increases, the velocity of shortening is going to decrease until it gets to zero. And the reason why it gets to zero at this point is because at this particular length, this muscle is not able to go against this particular load or able to lift this particular load. Now, if we were to increase the length of the muscle, what we would see is this. So the first thing that you should notice here is that even though we increase the length, the maximum velocity remain the same. 
And the reason why is because the maximum velocity of shortening is going to be determined by, by the muscle type. Now the main thing that you should notice here is let's take a look at a particular load and the velocity of shortening at one unit and compare it to two units. So let's just say we go to this load and compare it to the length at two units. So if you were to look at this load for the two units, what you would notice here is that the velocity of shortening at this load at the length of two units is greater than the velocity of shortening at this load for one unit. So in other words, as we increased the length or the preload of the ventricle, the velocity of shortening for any given afterload is going to be greater. And as we increase the length, we also can increase the amount of weight that we can move as well. So I hope this video helped you understand how these two parameters affect the velocity of shortening, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.